go ahead and go through our Unit 3 re review, Chemical and Physical Properties of Water. So we started off with Unit 3 talking about all these different properties of water that allow it to support the life on Earth. Things like polarity, surface tension, high specific heat, cohesion, and adhesion. So just a reminder, polarity basically just means those electrons are not shared equally, thus giving water its electronegative nature. Um, surface tension is how hard it is to break the surface layer of a water. So water almost creates a, a thin film at the surface, and that has to do with cohesion and adhesion as well. So cohesion, those water molecules binding to themselves, thus forms a film at the surface, and they already um, are attaching to the water molecules subsurface, thus creating this, what we refer to as a thick film at the surface, but, but it is uh, so microscopic. It allows things like water striders to actually um, sit on top of water. To, if you've ever been to a pond and seen leaves float on in the ocean, seaweed can float in it um, as well, and that's beca all because of that surface tension. When we talked about high specific heat, understand that that is the amount of energy that it takes uh, for, or specific heat is the amount of energy that it takes to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Um, so when we talk about water having a high specific heat, um, this is so important to our marine habitats because organisms are not having to adapt to water temperature changes daily and monthly. Um, so water is basically kind of staying the same temperature um, as our climate kind of uh, remains the same. And as weather changes, of course, that water temperature does change, but it is not an immediate effect. Then we started talking about water property relationships. And we did a few labs with this. Um, and the first lab we went over was regarding salinity, density, and buoyancy. So we built our penny boats. We started looking at, okay, what type of boat is going to, or what type of water is going to hold up a boat um, a little bit more. And when you did this, for the most part, I think 90% um, of the boats actually were upheld to the data that we were looking for. So your boat should have held more pennies in the saltwater environment. And that's due to this idea that as we increase the salinity, we are increasing the density of water, thus creating a force that pushes up on an object a little bit more, which is that buoyancy. So a saltier body of water is more dense and it is more buoyant. Um, we see this when we talk about the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea. So uh, people can actually float a lot easier in something that is, is more salty. They have more buoyancy. They have more force pushing up on them from below the surface. Then we started talking about salinity as it relates to temperature. Um, and we talked about how cold water actually holds on to more salt. So the colder the water is, the more dense it is, the more salt it has within it. And this is where we started talking about these temperature layers of the ocean. So moving a little bit from that chemical side of, of physical properties or chemical properties of water to the physical properties of water, our three temperature layers of the ocean are that surface layer, which is pretty thin, the thermocline where we start to see a drastic decrease in the temperature of the water, and then our deep water environment is where we find that super cold, super salty water. And it basically remains the same temperature from about 800 meters down. Getting into talking about our physical properties of water, we looked at waves and tides, um, and we saw that waves have a few components to them. So this image on the screen are the components that you need to know for your test. So the crest being the, the highest part of a wave, trough being the lowest part, and then wavelength is just the difference or the, the distance from crest to crest or from trough to trough. Then we got into talking about our tides, and we have two different types of tides, daily and monthly tides. In our daily tides, we see, for the most part, a semi-diurnal tide. And that just means that we have two high tides and two low tides a day. The high tides are about the same height as in the diagram, and the low tides are about the same height um, per the diagram as well. So this is our semi-diurnal tide. Our monthly tides, on the other hand, we talked about the two, and we talked about spring tides and neap tides. So your picture on the top is showing your sun, your earth, and then your moon in a perpendicular right angle structure. This is going to provide us with a neap tide. So a smaller tidal range, we're finding this at the first quarter moon and the third quarter moon. And at that angle, we do not have as much gravitational force pulling on these tides. So your high tide is not as high and your low tide is not as low. So your tidal range is very small in between that high and low tide. On the other hand, when we find uh, our moon phases that are new and our full moon, this is where we start to see that gravitational force, a centrifugal force, both working together and actually causing that water to bulge out on our sides of the earth 
where it is in line with the sun, the earth, and the moon. These are our spring tides. So this is where we have a very large tidal range. Your high tide is super high and your low tide is super low.